On today's episode of Japanese movies you've never seen, we're going to look at a little known Nakagawa Nobuo horror movie from the 1950s called Bore Kaibyo no Yashiki, or The Mansion of the Ghost Cat. Now, this is a typical Nakagawa Nobuo movie in certain senses. First of all, it was made by the Shin Toho Company, which was sort of the, uh, the, the poor brother of Toho, which was the big production company that made a lot of big movies, including Godzilla and things like that. Shin Toho was kind of the company that did the B-bills, and in the early days of its existence, it didn't even have enough money to make title credits for movies. In fact, one of my favorite... Uh, Japanese post-war musicals, Ginda, Ginza Kan Kan Musume, doesn't have a title card. But by the, time, uh, by, by the time Mansion of the Ghost Cat was made, they had upped their ante a little bit. And so at least it had an opening credit sequence. What Nakagawa Nobuo was known for was doing extraordinarily atmospheric Japanese horror movies, usually with a period theme. Not all the time, but most of them had a period setting. And what better time to bring in the, the ability to have sword fights, the ability to have ghosts, and the ability to have that atmospheric area of, of a country at war or a country that was shrouded in mist. So, so it seemed ideal. He is pr primarily known for a nine film series that he made in the middle of all of this, in addition to some of the musicals and other standard things he was making. And... This is not the most famous of them, but this is actually my favorite one. Probably the one that's most likely to have been seen in America is Jigoku, or Hell. That was released by Criterion Collection and has, had the made, and has made the rounds of a lot of film festivals. In it, a group of libertine kids gets involved in a series of antics that ends up getting them all sent to Hell. And the last third of the movie or so is that experience in uh, in Hades, and it's it's very extraordinary to look at, and it's it's very violent, especially from a 1960s standpoint. But uh, ultimately, it's one of those movies that's better to talk about than to see. It's not one that I absolutely love. The other one he's known for is Tokaido Yotsuya Kaidan. Now, this is the Yotsuya ghost story. It was a movie that was pretty much made every couple of years all the way from the silent eras through to today. And uh, one of the things that's important to realize about Japanese storytelling is unlike the Western style where there's spoilers, where you're afraid to give away the ending, not so much in, ja in, in Japan. In fact, with a story like the 47 Ronin or, uh, or, or, um, or Yotsuya Kaidan, you already know what's going to happen, so it's more or less the interpretation. And that's led to some Western critics sometimes giving Japanese movies more kudos than perhaps they should, because they say, oh, isn't it genius that this movie has an ellipse in the narrative? Well, no, it didn't have an ellipse in the narrative. Everyone knows the story. So, uh, so just because it jumped 15 years in the narrative and now suddenly, unless you're aware of the story, it won't make sense, you're kind of lost. But anyway... Uh, in, in, anyway, Bore Kaibyo no Yashiki is also interesting because it's an example of just how low Shin Toho would go. Because when you see the movie, one of the things that, takes, that, 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 that you take away from it is that it's actually kind of a cheat. And what do I mean it's a cheat? I mean, some of it is shot in black and white and color. Only, unlike something like The Wizard of Oz or inadvertently like A Man and a Woman, the reason it's partially shot in black and white in color is I have a sneaky suspicion is because it's two different movies that were stuck together rather uncomfortably, in fact. And while that might make it seem like, oh, this is another track of the vampire issue. Uh, that was a movie that was made by American International that, that uh, the same footage was basically used in four different movies. So while one might think that this would make the movie even more... Uh, off-putting, it actually, it, it, it actually gives it this kind of lovable air. The first story takes place in the modern age, and it's shot in black and white. So, okay, now we're saying something about the present being black and white and colorless versus the past, if we want to get all a PhD about it. And it's about a doctor who's having to move back to uh, his, his wife's 
old family mansion, which has, for one reason or other, been remained uh, desolate for a number of years. And it's because the house apparently has a curse. But because she has tuberculosis, they need to put her in a place where the weather is more uh, suitable for her rather than in Tokyo, rather especially in Reconstruction era Tokyo, and if you want to really be intertextual about a Godzilla era Tokyo. So in the house, from the very first evening, she's not comfortable. The dog barks incessantly. An old woman comes by as a, as a patient for the doctor setting up his medical business, and uh, yet she disappears. And then she shows up in the wife's room again, scaring her. Uh, finally, the husband, after the dog is killed, you know, I hate it when dogs get killed in a movie anyway, uh, at, at the husband and, and his friend go to a local priest, and the priest tells us the story of the house's haunting. Now, this is where we get the second, what I believe is a totally separate movie, that's shot in color, and it tells the story of a young man who goes to a local lord to play the game of Golt with him, which is sort of like the U.S. game Otello. And unfortunately, the lord is, is full of ego. And not only is he full of ego, he's a lousy go player. So the son beats him in the game. And naturally, when you beat someone who's of the samurai class, they do the only thing that they can to preserve their honor, which is to kill you. So the son is killed. And they tell his mother, who's a blind woman, that his body has, uh, that, that his body, that, that rather than that they've killed him, that he's gone away to another city to practice his goal because he was so humiliated that he lost the game. So the, the mother does not quite believe this. She goes back. And what does this noble lord do? Yes, he rapes her. And she is so devastated by the rape that she goes home and commits suicide, telling her cat to help her with the curse. And the cat licks up her blood. Now, this is actually a Japanese trope. This is something that's in a lot of other horror movies. So, again, it's, it's, it's not something that's new or original, but it's still, it's still fairly interesting. So, the cat goes back to, to the house. And meanwhile, the Lord's son has fallen in love with a servant girl. And the Lord is all very cast and very, I'm a samurai family and, and, and you cannot marry this girl. And, and he's being very unreasonable about it. But in the middle of the evening, he starts seeing premonitions of the ghost of the cat. <laughs> The ghost of the cat is, well, okay, let's put it delicately. It, it's kind of funny. And so it, it, that's another amusing thing about the movie, that you have this cat that's hilarious. And, and, and the Lord, in another trope from other Japanese horror movies, begins slashing uh, around with his samurai sword and in the process accidentally kills not only his son, but his son's girlfriend. He ends up killed as well. So the cat has won. The cat has achieved prominence. Now we come back to the modern day story. And the husband is delayed getting home to his wife. And she is being attacked by the old woman spirit again. falls in the wall and we find the body of the dead uh, son of the, the who, who originally went to play the goal game. So now we know the secret of why the house is still haunted. Nevertheless, with all the terrible things that have happened, the doctor and his wife return to Tokyo 
uh, where they adopt another cat. And that's how the movie ends. So again, the plot is not great. Uh, the, the scenes in it are pretty amazing. And what I find most intriguing about this is the number of story elements that are contained in its 68-minute running time. You've got two stories, both of which have very big elements. One of them is the whole idea of reconstruction after the war and, and some of the, the, the health issues. Uh, I'm only guessing it's tuberculosis. Maybe the woman was in Hiroshima, and, 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 and so she's having a little bit of, of nuclear radiation. Uh, we have the idea of the old house that has secrets. We have the idea of an old woman. Who's this old woman? We never find out uh, who, what, who she's a ghost of. She's just a random ghost that, 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 that haunts the place because she certainly doesn't look like anyone in the color section of the movie. We have um, a priest who can tell you stories of the past. When we go into the past, we have the whole Bushido code, the, the, the road of the warrior, the, the code of the warrior, the, 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 the sense of honor. We also are seeing the corruption. Why? Because this is right after the war. So you still had a lot of people who were feeling betrayed by the Bushido spirit, by the uh, supposed greatness and, 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 and in unconquerability of the kamikaze, the Japanese uh, spirit and, and, and the divine winds and all of that. So, so we, we, we see them grappling with that. We see a blind woman who's the mother who has her teeth blacked out in, in the old Edo fashion style, which now to us looks really ugly. And when she goes to try to find out what happens to her son, she is dishonored. She is raped. And, and we find out that the, the, sh the, the, the samurai might have, either, or the Lord might have actually had an interest in her before, and now he's using this, knowing he's killed her son, knowing she has no protection, as a way of attacking her. This is showing the position of how women are chattel, much more so in the old days than in the present. In the present, the husband's willing to put his practice aside for his wife. In the past, uh, the wife is, 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 I mean, the mother is, 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 is just casually murdered. And uh, when we see the son and his wife get killed, we don't even know who that wife character or the, the fiancé character is. She just happened to be a, a woman that he happened to have the hots for and who happened to be from a different cast. But she doesn't have any agency at all. She, we don't get into her character. And we see the ghost trying to attack the wife. We, we get that, that the husband arrives just in time. But... There's a possibility that the original ending of the movie was not her being alive at all, that she had somehow been killed. Remember, this is Japan. This is a very um, um, uh, 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 realistic part where, where, where even, in, uh, even in a Godzilla movie, you would have some cultural context, some cultural understanding of what the war had wrought. So, so there's a lot of... There's a lot of other meaning behind the superficial surface of this movie that seems so basic. And so that's why, even in a Shin Toho movie, even in a movie that's sloppy beyond belief, while still stylistic, also beyond belief, you have elements in it that make it still worth seeing today. And again, isn't that what watching movies is all about.